Yes, that sounds about right. Uh, so thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here for the, I don't know, second time probably. Um, uh, so I am, I suppose at this point, one of these people that is working in quantum field theory and curved space times, but I am not an expert in quantum field theory and curved space times. And I'm also going to talk about a space time that is not curved. And so one of the things that I've been sort of trying to do is to sort of understand what, how to build Feynman propagators in settings where, um, say, uh, Audemard parametrics is not feasible. Like, you can't sort of re really write it down. So in singular settings in particular. So I'm going to tell you a bit. I'm going to do my best to uh, give a sort of non-technical talk about a technical result. And so we'll see how that goes. Um, so we're going to talk about the Feynman propagator. Uh, for the wave equation with just a, in sort of the simplest singular setting that I know of. So I'll tell you a little bit about, uh, well, I'll wait to draw pictures. So let's describe the setup. So my aim is to find and describe the sort of Feynman inverse, which luckily has been talked at least obliquely about uh, for, oh, I, this board is twice as big as I thought. Oh, that's amazing. OK, that's great. Uh, for for this sort of problem. Uh, where I have the wave equation uh, so I unfortunately do not get to be uh, convention neutral in this talk because I'm going to have a sign restriction on this so um, this is the positive definite Laplacian if you like um, so, uh, so here I will just work on Rn uh, the restriction should be, well, uh, this sort of analog of charge should maybe, it doesn't need to have the good sign, but it needs to not have too bad of the bad sign. So in particular, uh, so R here is the sort of spatial radial coordinate. On Rn. Uh, and so we want this. Uh, analog of the charge to be bigger than minus and minus two over two squared, so that when it's negative you can sort of treat it with a Hardy inequality, and when it's positive it's helping you. Um, so uh, in situations where you want to worry about sort of uh, self-adjointness of the underlying Hamiltonian of Laplacian plus the inverse square potential, then uh, you. Then I have to say words, and you should just use the Friedrichs extension when it's not essentially self-adjoint. Um, the form domain, in particular, controls the H1 norm of the, like, sorry, the form on Rn. The form domain of the Laplacian plus f over r squared controls the H1 norm of uh, the function, as well as uh, one over the L2 norm of one over r times it. Okay. Uh, everything uh, that I'm going to say uh, is sort of most simply described for this, but seems to work equally well for uh, the case where you replace Rn with a with a cone. Uh, but then I can describe more if I wanted to say. All right, so we've had a couple of talks. We've had three talks at this point, and I think all of them have at least like mentioned the Feynman inverse. Uh, and I think we've gotten sort of both of my both of the characterizations that uh, I have written down first. So one one is the sort of um, 
uh, characterization or description that I hated the first time I heard and is sort of coming around to me, which is the sort of positive frequencies or forward in time and negative backwards. Uh, another is, um, this is, I thought I would get to be the first, since I was talking on Monday, I thought I would get to be the first to mention uh, the distinguished parametrices of Dijkstra-Mott and Hermander, and in fact, I am the third. Uh, so um, you can realize it in terms of a distinguished parametrics, at least in the smooth setting. This will nail it down at least up to a at least up to a sort of smooth remainder. And I guess this is sort of where the, the Audemars parametrics also fits in. Um, but instead, what I'd like to do is to, so, so the, you know, as we've seen mentioned, the characteristic set for the wave equation has two connected components, and you sort of choose a distinguished parametrics by deciding uh, on each uh, of the two connected components, whether you want to flow uh, forward in time or backward in time, or in the sort of more uh, symplectic view, you have to choose whether you want to flow with the Hamilton vector field or against the Hamilton vector field. And so the, the say, the forward propagator involves solving forward in time on both of those components, so that is with the Hamilton vector field on the forward pointing one and against the Hamilton vector field on the backward pointing one. And uh, the Feynman inverse would then be characterized as saying, in each component, you want to flow with the Hamilton vector field. Um, and I'd like to sort of take that to its endpoints in some sense and sort of reformulate in terms of the sort of behavior. At infinity, and so there are a number of, of ways of doing this. Uh, I had thought that um, perhaps Michal would uh, have talked about them in his talk, but he didn't. Um, so I'm not. I, you know, when you write the talk, you have to sort of guess what other people will do. It's kind of fun. Uh, but so 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 you can characterize it in terms of the sort of asymptotic behavior as you go to sort of uh, as you send time to infinity. Uh, I'm going to, in fact, take um, I'm going to use the sort of approach that, I, to my knowledge, is was first written down in this form of uh, by Gail Redmond, Haber, and Vashi, and it'll be encoded always. It'll be encoded in. Uh, I do this when I teach. Too. Uh, It'll be and it'll be encoded in some Sobolev spaces, which I will describe in hopefully only vague terms, but not yet. So, um, so the sort of. statement of the theorem. And one has, um, on, in one k, in one setting, one sense the uh, theorem is if f is in some appropriate weighted Sobolev space, appropriately interpreted, then there is a Feynman solution of u. So there, there's an inverse to this operator that gives you the Feynman solution. Uh, and you can talk about the Feynman solution for certain a certain range of weights. Now, uh, I promised that this would be a non-technical talk, and that is the least, no, I hoped that this would be a non-technical talk. That's the least technical way that I can state the theorem. It's also not interesting and not descriptive yet. So unfortunately, I have to compromise a little bit. Uh, so for... Uh, 
uh, sort of notation, um, I'm going to take rho to be like 1 over the square root of r squared plus t, to be like 1 over r plus t. Uh, and I'm going to take, so y, this will be some weighted version of some Sobolev space. And so this is going to be a, uh, So if you want this to be non-technical, you pretend that this is a Sobolev space. And if you want it to be slightly more technical, uh, it is a Sobolev space that has variable order. And if you want it to be even more technical, it is a Sobolev space adapted to a certain other class of vector fields called B vector fields. So it's measuring sort of rho d rho and d by d theta. Um, and then the other sort of set of function spaces is going to be a set of things that are in the corresponding Sobolev space. So that when you hit them with, oh, coding symbol, and then I, I was trying to give you a, a dictionary, and in the process of the di making a dictionary of words, I used, I defined, I used a word I hadn't defined yet to define that word. So L is going to be a conjugate, I guess, or essentially a conjugate. So in some sense, this is... What is this L? This L? Absolutely not. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so this L um, is here because uh, I, it's for my own purposes in some sense. So really, the proper way to tell this story from a pedagogical point of view is to uh, excise that L from this talk and just you know, carry along the weights and figure things out. But as like an error checking point of view, I have like internalized knowledge about how this thing works, and I don't trust myself to get the numerology right for any other operator. All right, so in some sense, the theorem, uh, so no, there's one more. There's one more term on here that might be hiding from you that I also haven't sort of told you about. And that's this letter M. Yeah. This letter M is a function uh, essentially on phase space, but really sort of just on the sort of inf infinite part of phase space. Uh, it's a function on the cosphere bundle uh, that. Uh, describing the order of the Sobolev space. And in some sense, this is where the magic will happen. It will encode the sort of Feynman prop property. And I'll say more about that in a few minutes. I'm happy to elaborate on this, and I will elaborate on this, but uh, for now, you can just sort of believe me that there, I can write down some function on phase space that encodes the Feynman proper, property. And then the theorem uh, is that if um, for m that has not been defined yet, but for a particular choice of m, let's cheat appropriately chosen M. And for L less than one half plus 
So for L in this range, uh, then um, uh, oh sorry, then L going from the x spaces to the y spaces is invertible. And then, you know, one has to work sort of a bit more, uh, and this goes through um, the sort of work. The shortest path I know goes through work of Michal and Christian Girard uh, to um, show that indeed this, uh, uh, the inverse that you find here uh, that I've claimed encodes the Feynman property actually agrees with what sort of other people would say is the Feynman inverse as well, at least near infinity. So. That's the sort of uh, main initial theorem. And because, in some sense, I am who I am, it comes with the sort of other corollary, which is that there's a sort of there's a complete asymptotic expansion. Uh, for this inverse of f, when f is as nice as it can possibly be. So if you have some smooth, compactly supported f that's supported away from the singularity of the potential, then you can describe completely the asymptotic behavior of the Feynman inverse. And to do that, and to also say more about what this M is, I get I have to draw a few pictures. Um, yeah, so um, pictures or geometric setup. So, so what we'll do is we'll sort of uh, essentially I want to treat this. Uh, as a sort of operator. I want to think of Rn as being a cone over a sphere, and I want to treat this as like a reasonable conic operator on Rn. So what I'll do is I'll radially compactify this um, time cross a half line and end up with, I'll think of this sort of half space as being the interior of um, half of a disk. And so rho will be uh, sort of boundary. To, I've sort of glued on all of the uh, sort of endpoints of the rays that started at the origin in all of the different directions. And so this row vanishes exactly at that boundary that I've glued, glued on. Um, and I'm going to call a defining function for this x. So uh, I'm going to call this thing, I don't know. It's not clear that this needs a name, except that I'm at the end of this board. So we'll let our compactification of our sort of full space time be uh, this sort of small picture that I've drawn uh, crossed with as n minus one. Uh, if you like, we've taken the, if you prefer, which I think about three people in here prefer, we've taken the radial compactification of Minkowski space and blown up the, uh, the time axis. I'm sorry? Thank you. N should be at least three. Um, I suspect, though I have not bothered to work it out because I don't know who the audience would be, I suspect that I can make it work in N equals two. Um, then the condition is that this needs to be positive and have the good sign. Um, but it's like, 
significant. We've got to work hard. All right, so you should think of this sort of set where rho equals zero, this sort of set of points that I've glued on at infinity as describing where all of the different sort of directions that you can go to infinity end up. And so there are some distinguished submanifolds of M. I will just draw as So one distinguished submanifold is where all the light rays end up. So, well, I guess there are two of them. I'll call them S plus and S minus. So these are where light rays end up. And then I'll call the North Pole and the South Pole. Uh, they're not as distinguished as S plus and S minus, but they, you're they're fairly distinguished. Um, uh, so. Um, and the North Pole and the South Pole are sort of where you end up if you uh, start at some fixed point and decide not to move at all and just let time tick away. So uh, the other picture I want to draw is uh, the space on which you have this complete asymptotic expansion. So let's blow up the... Uh, these submanifolds. So this is effectively like we want to separate out the different directions at which you can approach these submanifolds. Uh, so when you blow up the North Pole and the South Pole, you sort of have uh, a point now for every. Um, for sort of all of the different points that you could have started at. So this is the this these two temporal faces just basically look like whatever you started. They're, they're copies of Rn essentially, or Rn with the origin blown up. Uh, and more interesting are where you've replaced S plus and S minus, where you're sort of separating out all of the different um, sort of all of the different uh, geodesics that approach S plus and S minus, and you end up with the sort of fam more familiar uh, <laughs> future and past null infinities, or I guess conventionally denoted with a script i. And then I'll just give these other sort of remaining pieces of the, pieces of the boundary, uh, C plus, C minus, and C0. So C0 uh, is sort of conformal to, uh, C0 is conformal to the series space, and C plus and C minus are conformal to hyperbolic space. OK. so. Now, I have a little bit of a train. Oh, no. I had hoped uh, foolishly that I could get through without erasing. Oh, I'm always very intimidated to erase. Right. Cool. All right. So this is the space. Oh, I need to give it a name. Let's just call it M bar. The space with these sort of a bunch of additional boundary pieces of the boundary. I'll call M bar. 
this is the space on which there is a complete asymptotic expansion for the solution for the Feynman inverse when you have really nice data. Um, but I think first I promised you what this little m should look like. So. Uh, Function little m has a bunch of um, a bunch of requirements essentially forced on it. So the first is that uh, near s minus we want to encode that it should look like sort of negative energy things that went back, like negative frequency waves that went backwards in time. So sort of positive frequency waves need to be sort of prevented from reaching S minus. And likewise, negative frequency waves need to be prevented from reaching S plus. And so what will, that's encoded uh, essentially in, um, in this M by demanding that on the sort of Uh, part of the characteristic set that lives over S minus has a forward directed and a past directed part. So what we're going to demand is that M should be too big, that is more regular than any past directed positive frequency wave on the part of the characteristic set that corresponds to positive frequency waves. And uh, it should be not too regular so that it allows the, uh, the, pos the negative frequency waves on the other part of the characteristic set. So it needs to be sort of above some threshold. In this case, it can, it's a half. Uh, on the parts, so. where this corresponds, so this is the part of the, the, the above S minus, the characteristic set just looks like the co-normal bundle of S minus, and it's got two components, and the forward directed component uh, tells you about um, sort of positive frequency waves, and it needs to be, uh, M needs to be big enough to rule those out at S minus, and a sort of similar story at S plus. And it needs to build below the same threshold on the other two. Because it needs to allow those waves to reach them. Uh, so immediately right here, you can see why you're stuck with the variable order land, because I need this, uh, I need the order of my Sobolev space to be bigger than a half in some places and less than a half in some other places. And uh, that's very hard to achieve with a constant. And this has got to actually be a genuine um, function on phase space as well, because these things are living above the same point. Uh, it's convenient for me if it's also equal to a half in a neighborhood of um, x equals zero. Uh, I don't think I gave this a name. Let's call it, I don't know, CF is x equals zero. Uh, so m is going to be a fun is m is a function on the cosphere bundle of m. Uh, that's why it's been given this name. Uh, and so then there are some other things that also get forced on it. Uh, you would like to be able to take information from one part and propagate it elsewhere. So you'd like to be able to have a sort of propagation of regularity theorem, which tells you that um, in particular, M should be decreasing along the Hamilton flow in the characteristic set. And uh, finally, 
or well, finally, I'd also like m to be homogeneous of degree zero in rho at least near rho equals zero. So one and the first two are essentially forced on you by uh, um, by wanting to encode with your Sobolev space the Feynman propagator or the Feynman inverse. Uh, the third one is convenient for me, partly because a half is between something bigger than a half and something smaller than a half. Uh, and it's very convenient to me to have something be constant there. Uh, also, the dual of a map from h a half to h minus a half is also a map from h a half to h minus a half. That's very, very convenient as well. Uh, the fourth one is forced on you essentially by propagation of singularities and wanting to sort of make any of the estimates, piece together any estimates. And the fifth one uh, is not really forced on you, but it's very convenient in terms of inducing a sort of Sobolev space on this boundary that we've glued in on infinity. Uh, so then what these Y spaces are, are you take the, um, essentially you take, uh, there be Sobolev spaces with this order. And actually it's probably not very helpful for me to say more about that. Uh, so then the asymptotics, on uh, on this space uh, are disappointingly for me uh, essentially the same asymptotics that you would expect if you sort of just looked at the forward at the any either of the causal propagators um, so they're written in terms so uh, the full statement is that this has a sort of full joint expansion uh, if as a, uh, in terms of powers of all of the various defining functions and the expansions match and their joint expansions. Um, and I can just tell you what the exponents are. So at um, so at null infinity, this is the sort of least interesting part. They're just given the exponents are just integers. So it's n minus one over two. Like one over, so so you would say this was like one over t to the n minus one over two and a smooth expansion after that, uh, but we've taken out the n minus conveniently gone. Oh no, it's not. We've uh, conveniently taken out the n minus one over two uh, part uh, at c at both of the sort of at all of the sort of big parts of the boundary. You have a an expansion that looks like half plus root of n minus two over two squared plus lambda j plus f, okay. So here k, again, is just an integer, uh, a non-negative integer, and lambda j is the jth eigenvalue of the n minus one dimensional sphere. And then finally at Uh, not finally, so uh, at the temporal faces, you have whatever you have. I think I'm feeling less confident in my numerology. Have something slightly different. I think this should still be a half. And then finally, at the uh, 
At this face, you have um, n minus minus n. So you have sort of what you what you might expect. Unfortunately, it's like um, I was hoping when I started this project that I would get a different answer for the Feynman propagator. I don't know why I thought that was like in the realm of possibility, but it's not. You get exactly the same answer. Um, I'm, I'm sorry? Oh, yeah, sorry, except it's C0. Well, yeah, except it's C0. But it's the same numbers. Yeah, I was hoping I would get different numbers. Um, I've developed a relatively recent fascination with uh, sort of doing projects that give me lists of numbers. And I really like when I get different lists of numbers. They're not, even in this heat, these are not quite self drawing. So here is where I start really breaking the promise about a non-technical project. Um, but luckily, there are only nine minutes left. Well, you get three extra minutes then. And you can thank Peter. Um, So I know essentially one way to show that something is invertible, and that is to show that it is Fred Holm, and then to show that its kernel and co-kernel are both zero. So the sort of first, and in some sense uh, only, uh, the, 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 the first and sort of hardest step that has many sub-steps is to show that L is Fred Holm. So this has a few steps. We've got an order and a weight. And you need to sort of improve both of them in order to have a compact inclusion of the, the sort of, of one into the other. So what this uses, or maybe it doesn't need it. Maybe you have a much simpler proof, and I would love to hear it. And um, it would break my heart to know, but I would ultimately come around to it. It would be great. Um, so, so, also, it goes without saying. Uh, no, it should have gone with saying, but it went without saying uh, that the the problem is one where using the Fourier transform is really quite hairy. And uh, also, my aim is to sort of work. Even though this is a sort of nice model problem, my aim is to work in a sort of setting where I'm not actually explicitly relying on the Fourier transform. So there are some aspects of that which are is a little bit of a lie. So I'm going to use sort of microlocal propagation estimates, like Hermander's theorem. Um, sort of, uh, I want to piece together and get something along the lines of estimating u by LU plus u in a sort of better space. But uh, the sort of microlocal aspect of this is not going to ever improve your weight, and you want to hope at least to improve the, the, the order. So to get so. Oh. 
So you're not going to sort of be able to improve the, the, the weight, but you, you might hope to improve the order. So what you would like is that m prime is strictly less than m everywhere. So I had thought uh, when I sort of first started thinking about this problem that this would be by far the um, most straightforward step where I could just sort of cite the literature. And in most, in most of the cases, so, so somehow the most, sort of, uh, the, the, the fine, basically everywhere except at the singularity, that's true. At the singularity, um, you want to sort of propagate through, uh, you want to propagate regularity sort of through, through the singularity and back out at the level of H a half. So there are two um, sort of problems with this. So there are, there's a large literature about propagating regularity through sort of singularities, like conic singularities or inverse square potentials. Uh, and they all sort of work relative to H1 and treat H1 as like uh, a sort of, they, they want to sort of propagate in regularity stronger than H1 and sort of treat that as the base thing and throw all of the error terms there. So you need, for one thing, to be able to instead put the thing in H1 uh, and so you have to actually just go through those papers and redo all of them with like keeping track of those error terms, which is annoying, but fine. The more serious thing is that I've just described to you how do you like that you want to prove this for H1, and I've told you you need this for H a half. So you need to be able to sort of shift the order from one to a half. And in the sort of smooth setting, you have a variety of ways to do this. Uh, but effectively, what they all boil down to is you have something that sort of almost or sort of morally commutes with your operator that shifts the orders around. And so you would like, uh, you would like some operator that's reasonable that maps from essentially H1 to H1 half and back again that basically commutes with Laplacian plus an inverse square potential, or with, uh, sorry, uh, D'Alembertian plus an inverse square potential. And that, um, I would love to know if there is an easier way. Right now, what I am doing is constructing complex powers of the, right now, what I've essentially done is construct complex powers of the associated elliptic operator, where instead of minus dt squared, you have plus dt squared. It's uh, more work than I would like to be in. If you have an easy drop in argument, I would really love to hear it. But in any case, ultimately, you get, you get here. Then, uh, you also need the same sort of statement for the adjoint, which has the arrows go the other way, um, to the other sort of aspect of this is you want to improve the weight here. So you'll invert a sort of normal operator on the boundary. And this is another. Um, we'll call this uh, sort of, I'll call this operator P sigma. It's essentially what you get by conjugating L by the Mellon transform in rho. And this has, uh, um, so you need to invert it. So, you know, you might show that it's Fred Holm by slightly easier arguments because you've sort of lost a dimension now. And P sigma is also classically elliptic. Uh, but more interesting, what kind of operator is P sigma? Um, to show that it has no kernel or co-kernel, uh, what you undo is, well, now I'm going to sort of really lie and separate very, not lie, uh, use the fact that I'm working on a model problem and separate variables. And you can think of. Um, You can think of uh, E sigma as an ODE with regular singular points. But unfortunately, it's got four of them. So, you know, there's a one of the wonderful things about and regions with regular singular points is that they've been well studied for you know, over 100 years. And going back at least to Gauss, 
well over 100 years. Uh, but part of it is um, a lot is known about the hypergeometric function with three regular singular points, partly because everything with three regular singular points can be made into a hypergeometric function. This is uh, something called a Hoyne, Hoyne ODE. And actually, very little is known in general about them. Uh, and I was not, I'm not in, sorry, I am interested in knowing more in general about them. I don't want to say I'm not. Um, but I was also interested in finishing the problem. Uh, <laughs> and if it, it turns out, so the, the four regular singular points correspond to our four uh, distinguished submanifolds. And it turns out that if you are sort of very careful with your coordinate choice on M, you can turn this into a pair of coupled uh, different coupled hypergeometric equations, essentially one ranging from the north pole to S minus, and one going from S from the south pole to S plus, with a sort of transition rule in the overlap. And so, essentially, what our, so I'm pointing at things that are no longer there. Uh, what our Sobolev spaces are doing, so they've induced some, so our Sobolev spaces are chosen so that they induce Sobolev spaces on this chunk of the boundary. And uh, among other things, our various conditions impose restrictions on which solutions you can have at each of the singular points. So the Feynman property, uh, imposes a sort of one-sided wavefront set condition at S plus and S minus, uh, which basically corresponds to like a minus I zero continuation property for the, the corresponding hypergeometric equation. And the conditions at S plus at the north and south poles uh, impose a regularity condition that you should take the regular of the sort of hypergeometric equations. And so then it's a question of like, um, is there a pair of hypergeometric equations that satisfies the, so, so, so this thing has kernel or co-kernel precisely when there is a pair of hypergeometric functions that is regular here and regular here and satisfies the transition and has only one sided wavefront set in the uh, S plus and S minus, and that happens exactly um, at these values of sigma. And uh, that's where this sort of comes from. All right, I will, uh, Stop here, and I'm happy to elaborate on anything. <laughs>